Hi, and welcome to another edition of Your Health with Dr. Christie. My name is Dr. Christie Reisinger, and today we're going to talk about the power of the placebo effect. I've often been amazed by the data surrounding placebos. Numerous studies have shown the power of the placebo effect, and today I'd like to discuss some of those studies and give you ways to take this information and relate it to your personal health. First, let's define what a placebo is. Placebos are often called sugar pills, even though they can be in any form, including a pill, tablet, injection, or medical device. Whatever form they take, placebos look like the real medical treatment, except they do not contain any active medication in them. The modern idea of the placebo effect began in 1955 when U.S. physician Henry Beecher analyzed the results of 15 studies and concluded that, regardless of a patient's complaint, around one-third showed a significant response to a placebo. Did you catch that statistic? One-third of people had some sort of response to the placebo or a sugar pill. Isn't that interesting? The placebo effect is now well established, particularly for conditions that are controlled by the brain and are subjectively reported, such as pain, stress-related insomnia, and fatigue. Well, what is recent data shown about the power of the placebo effect? Well, a 2014 study published in Science Translational Medicine studied 66 patients with migraines. They were each allowed to have a migraine that received no treatment, and this served as a control. Then, in six subsequent migraine attacks, each participant was given different treatments, which included 10 milligrams of erisotriptan, also known as Maxalt, and told that it was Maxalt, or told that it was placebo. And then they were given a placebo and told that it was placebo, or told that it was Maxalt. In the end, Maxalt was better than placebo for pain relief. But what's fascinating is that when patients took placebo but were told it was Maxalt, the effects were the same as when they were given Maxalt and told it was Maxalt. How incredible is that? And another meta-analysis published in 2005 reviewed 45 placebo-controlled randomized trials of patients with irritable bowel syndrome, and it showed a very powerful placebo effect. Researchers found the placebo response ranged from 16 to 71%, with an average placebo response of 40%. But let's pause and think about this. 40% of patients receiving a placebo had a beneficial effect on their IBS symptoms. But do all patients respond to placebos in the same way? No. And in one meta-analysis published in March 2015 in Lancet Psychiatry, it showed that patients with a higher chance for a placebo response are those that had a lower symptom severity at baseline and if they were in a research study in the United States. In fact, researchers have seen a trend that the placebo effect has grown stronger, which is felt to be related to the flood of direct-to-consumer drug advertising that repeatedly espouses the benefits of medication and increases patients' expectations that medication will help them. And with time, there will be more studies on the relationship between certain genes and the amount of placebo effect that's seen. But in real medical practice, how can physicians use placebo without deception? I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable administering fake pills in order to harness the positive placebo effects they may provide. Is there any chance that placebos will still work when patients are told they are placebos? Well, yes. The data shows consistent positive results to back this up. For example, there was a 2010 study using placebos for the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome. But in this study, patients were told they were receiving a sugar pill. This type of trial is called an open-label placebo trial. And the results were fascinating. 59% of patients who knowingly took sugar pills reported adequate relief from their symptoms, compared with 35% in the no-treatment group. And remember that 2014 migraine study that I mentioned using Maxalt? Researchers found that even when they told patients that the pill they were taking was a placebo, the placebo was still 50% as effective as the real drug in reducing pain during a migraine headache. This open-label placebo concept was further studied in an interesting trial in 2016 out of Portugal. 
It included 83 adults with chronic low back pain. At the start of the study, all participants were asked if they had heard of the placebo effect and explained in approximately 15 minutes four discussion points that included, number one, the placebo effect can be powerful, number two, the body automatically can respond to taking placebo pills. Number three, a positive attitude can be helpful but is not necessary. And number four, taking the pills faithfully for the 21 days of the trial was critical. All participants were also shown a video clip of a real TV news report supporting the positive placebo effect. Well, despite the fact that participants knowingly took placebo pills, researchers still found statistically significant moderate to large pain reduction on three different self-reported pain scales. Furthermore, open-label placebo treatment also reduced self-reported disability scores. The researchers concluded that open-label placebo pills presented in a positive context may be helpful to reduce the pain and disability from chronic low back pain. What are some of the ways these types of trials can be used in clinical practice? Are there roles for placebos themselves? Some researchers have suggested that this could be one of the ways that doctors can reduce the amount of medication given to patients. And a report in the journal Pain discussed a controversial way to use placebos in practice. By interspersing placebos in with conventional therapies, is it possible to extend the effects of drug treatments? Using placebos this way could extend the effects of pain medications without increasing doses or side effects and help to decrease patient dependence and lower cost. And as long as this was discussed with the patient carefully along with the explanation of the placebo effect, this could start to change the way we approach pain treatments. Medicine still has a very long way to go before we can use the placebo effect in a way that is most effective for the patient. But in the meantime, one powerful takeaway for me is the power of hope that a physician can provide a patient. And even with all of the pressures of modern medicine, one of the most powerful aspects in medicine is the physician-patient relationship. So in conclusion, one of the most powerful things you can do as a patient is to find a physician that you trust and that interactions with them are positive and provide hope. This type of interaction alone has been shown to contribute to the placebo effect of any treatment, whether that's with a pill that's been prescribed that induces the simple healing ritual of taking a pill, or the physician as medicine, meaning the relationship alone with the physician can be one of healing and hope. Today, we've talked about the powerful positive aspects of the placebo effect, but my next episode will be about the powerful negative effect of placebos, something called the nocebo effect. Thanks again for joining me.